Hello and welcome to this edition of Wineskins. I'm Father Jim Corda. Wineskins is a program that features reflections on the lives of the saints and the sacred scriptures, along with a variety of issues and topics, all from a Catholic perspective. Wineskins is brought to you through the annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts, a division of the Society of St. Paul. On our program today, I will speak with Father Jeff Mickler on the Vatican II document on ecumenism. We will also hear more information on the Feast of the Conversion of St. Paul and today, as the Church celebrates a second Sunday in ordinary time, we will get a deeper insight into those particular Sunday readings. That and more on Wineskins. To tell us more about marriage and family life in the Diocese of Youngstown is Dave Schmidt. This Wednesday, January 22nd, marks the 47th anniversary of the Roe v. Wade and Doe v. Bolton decisions by the United States Supreme Court, which, unfortunately, legalized abortion on demand throughout our land. Forty-seven years later, with over 60 million unborn children destroyed, abortion remains a source of social and political contention in our country. Because abortion is such a divisive issue in an already divided land, we might be tempted to avoid the topic in order to avoid conflict. But, as Edmund Burke is quoted as saying, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. In their pastoral plan for pro-life activities, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops gives us a blueprint of what we can do to resist the evil of abortion. It can be summed up in four words, pray, care, inform, and advocate. Pray. As followers of Jesus Christ, prayer should always be the starting point of anything we attempt to do. In prayer, we seek God's guidance and acknowledge that any true change in our world is brought about by him. Prayer helps us to focus on the issue at hand and view it through God's eyes. Certainly, we should pray for an end to abortion. In addition, we should pray for an end to the circumstances that cause many women to resort to abortion. We should pray for fathers, that they take responsibility for the children that they help to conceive. We should pray that the church and society offer the support and resources necessary for women facing challenging pregnancies. We should pray for doctors and other medical professionals that they always use their skills to preserve and protect life and do no harm. There are several upcoming opportunities to pray for an end of abortion. One is occurring today. Bishop Murray of the Diocese of Youngstown is celebrating a Mass for Life this morning, January 19th at 1030 at the Basilica of St. John the Baptist in Canton. In addition, Bishop Murray will be celebrating another Mass for Life on Sunday, January 26th at 4 p.m. at St. Columba Cathedral in Youngstown. And the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops encourages all to pray a special novena called Nine Days for Life. This opportunity to pray for the respect and protection of human life includes a different intention for each day, accompanied by a short reflection, suggested actions, and related information. Care. In order to provide improved pastoral responses to women facing unexpected or challenging pregnancies, Archbishop Nauman, chairman of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops Committee on Pro-Life Activities, is calling on all bishops and parishes to participate in a special initiative called Walking with Moms in Need. Archbishop Nauman notes that pregnant and parenting moms in need are in our parishes and our neighborhoods. Women facing challenging pregnancies should see the church as a place where they can find help, especially with its myriad of social services and organizations dedicated to meeting the needs of people in crisis. Inform. We need to remind ourselves and those around us that all human life is sacred, regardless of the circumstances or stage of development. Science tells us that the unborn child's heart begins to beat at about 21 days after conception, and brain waves can be detected as early as five weeks of gestation. We need to remind ourselves and those around us that abortion is not health care, but an act of violence that destroys a child and often leaves deep emotional wounds and psychological scars on the mother and others impacted by the abortion. Advocate. As American citizens, we are in a unique position to advocate for the lives of unborn children. Sure, politics is messy, 
but our government is of the people, by the people, and for the people. Therefore, we have the responsibility to speak out against the obvious injustice of abortion. So, as we acknowledge this sad anniversary of legalized abortion in our country, I challenge you to do your part and pray, care, inform, and advocate for lives of unborn children and mothers in crisis pregnancies. For more information, contact the Office of Pro-Life, Marriage, and Family Life at the Diocese of Youngstown at www.doy.org. For Wineskins, this is Dave Schmidt. St. Paul was the Apostle to the Gentiles. To tell us more is Diana Hancherenko. She is the Young Adult Minister at St. Angela Marici Church in Youngstown. This feast originated in France at the end of the 6th century, when some relics of the Apostle were transferred there. It was not celebrated in Rome until the 11th century, perhaps in connection with the Feast of the Chair of St. Peter, celebrated in France on January 18th. The importance of the conversion of the Apostle to the Gentiles is evident from the three accounts given in the Acts of the Apostles. It is evident also from the prayers in the Mass and in the Liturgy of the Hours. The biblical account of what happened to Paul on the road to Damascus describes the radical change that took place. He who was formerly persecuting us is now preaching the faith he tried to destroy, as written in the book of Galatians. The Apostle himself always contrasts that experience on the road to Damascus with what had preceded it. In legal observance, I was a Pharisee, and so zealous that I persecuted the Church. I was above reproach when it came to justice based on the law. But those things I used to consider gain, I have now reappraised as loss in the light of Christ. All that from his letter to the Philippians. But it is not simply a matter of conversion as a personal experience of Paul. It is also a phase of development in the history of the Church, as recorded in the book of Acts. St. Luke states, All except the apostles scattered throughout the countryside of Judea and Samaria. After that, Saul began to harass the Church. He entered house after house, dragged men and women out, and threw them in jail. The opening prayer at Mass is derived from the French Missal, and it contains two interrelated themes. The first one presents the dynamics of Paul's conversion and following of Christ. Some have tried to use psychological principles to explain his conversion experience. St. Luke does not describe events in a chronological order, but although it was a case of sudden divine intervention, its meaning was revealed gradually. Thus, in the first account, the incident is made known only to Ananias. In the second account, its significance is revealed to Paul indirectly through Ananias, and in vague terms, only in the third account does the risen Christ reveal to Paul the nature and extent of his mission. The second theme of the opening prayer is contained in the phrase, bearing witness to your truth. But to be a witness to the truth of Christ, like St. Paul, requires that we discover the meaning of the faith in the events and experiences of life, both individual and ecclesial. Paul himself, after the dazzling experience on the road to Damascus, spent three years in Arabia, southeast of Damascus, in order to grasp fully the specific dimensions of his vocation. There is yet another theme in Pauline spirituality, and it appears especially in the communion antiphon, the third antiphon for evening prayer, and in the office of readings. Christ is the focal point and center of the life of St. Paul. His contact with Christ on the road to Damascus was not only a transforming and crucial experience, it became a primary point of reference for all of his apostolic ministry. Thus we read in the third antiphon for evening prayer, For me, life is Christ, and death is gain. And in the communion antiphon, I live by faith in the Son of God. That transformation on the road to Damascus, which was always in the forefront of his mind, was the source of Paul's theology and spirituality. For Wineskins, I'm Diana Hancherenko. Welcome to our segment called Year of Faith, celebrating the 16 documents of the Second Vatican Council. I'm Father Jim Corda. And I'm Father Jeffrey Mickler of the Society of St. Paul. The document that we will discuss today is the Decree on Ecumenism. Ecumenism, it is an essential part of our faith today. It has to do with the Church's relations with the other ecclesial communities within Christianity. 
whether they're the Orthodox communities, the evangelical communities, etc. And this document set us on a very profound new course in our relationship with the other believing communities of the world. Let's talk about that word uh, ecumenism. Is it different than the word ecumenical? Well, they're both interrelated. They have the same roots. Uh, ecumenical is an adjective, so we have an ecumenical spirit. We have an ecumenical movement. These words are an attempt to really see the universal believing community in a new light and to have a new attitude towards the other faith communities. I'm old enough to remember the pre-Vatican II attitude. We were right, they were wrong, have nothing to do with them, pray that they change their minds, and who knows what they're up to. And that was sort of the attitude that permeated the church and the people of God. Now, because of this document, we are able to meet with, worship with, learn from the other communities, and build, I think, a more stable civilization on earth while we have a humbler attitude in our relation to them and a humbler attitude in our relationship with God himself. I'm wondering if healing needs to take place or has taken place over these 50 years. For example, I remember when I was first ordained and a, a woman had asked me about her daughter who was getting married outside of the church for whatever reason. And she really wanted to go to the wedding, but wasn't able to because we did not encourage them to do that. How has that changed and and has it changed? Is it appropriate for us to talk about that? Well, it's only partially changed because in an ecumenical dialogue, you need two groups to be talking. And although we have extended the olive branch to all the faiths of the world, especially within Christianity, many of them would prefer not to have any ecumenical encounter uh, with Catholics. So it's a long, arduous process. But I have to say, for example, in the evangelical churches, uh, when I was growing up, 90% of them, I would guess, would think Catholics were not Christian they were pagans, that they were following Baal or some other ancient god or goddesses. Now, because of multiple factors, many of the evangelical churches, they'll see us as Christians. Heretical Christians, it's true, but at least as Christians. There'll still be whole segments of the evangelical community that still sees us in the traditional pagan way. So you can see how progress has been made, but it's a tough, arduous road to increase understanding in all directions, our understanding of them and their understanding of us. You know how oftentimes when we name ourselves or label ourselves as Catholics, we don't just say Catholics, we always say Catholic Christians. It's almost redundant, isn't it? Well, it is, but it came about because so many would not recognize Catholicism as being a truly Christian faith. Progress has been made in that area thanks to this document and the attitude that seminarians, priests, bishops, laity have had so that we do have various prayer groups, we have even mutual retreats together, and we listen to the faith journey of others as they listen to ours. And so the walls are breaking down ever so slowly, but in an important direction. Let's talk about that whole um, mandate of unity. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's really what the document is encouraging and talking about as Christ's mandate to us that they may be one as we are one. How does that impact us and uh, how is that drawn out of this document itself? Yes, well, Jesus' last prayer, really, for his disciples was just that. He knew what was coming. He knew there would be divisions. He knew that there would be conflict in his divine nature. He understood these things, but he prayed that somehow this believing community would have unity of heart, mind, and soul. I think we're getting closer to that, but we're not getting closer on a unity of church structure or church institutions. But this is a process the Holy Spirit has to work out between all sincere believers and people with an open heart 
that allows the Spirit of God to move into them. And I oftentimes go back to that concept that ecumenism is really a dialogue. Mm -hmm. It's a talking. It's a speaking. It's a listening. It's not just preaching to, Mm -hmm. but it's actually talking and listening and discerning what is it that we have in common? What is it that we can build on instead of what is it that really divides us. Mm -hmm. And many times we'll find when people of two different Christian faiths get together, we have preconceptions. You Catholics believe in A, B, C, and D. And we say, no, no, we don't. Or we might say, oh, you Protestants act E, F, G, H. And they'll say, we do? (laughs) We try to define the others rather than let them define themselves. And in the process, there's been a lot of confusion over the years and over the centuries. And we're in a position now where, at least from the Catholic perspective, we're making the effort. I think that so often for us as, as Catholics is that when we were schooled in the faith and taught about the faith, things were not always explained to us. This is why we believe what we believe. How important is it for us today as a a knowledgeable Catholic to understand the truths and documents of our faith and doctrines of our faith so we can not explain them, but better understand them and internalize them for ourselves. I think you touched on a critical point. First, you have to know what the basics are, and then you say, what does that mean for me? Does it really change my life? Does it really help me live my life? Does it enrich the lives of people I love? And that takes time for personal reflection, personal prayer, personal meditation within the context of liturgical spiritual life of the church. And each individual has an enormous responsibility to do that. We have the Catechism of the Catholic Church. We have the Scriptures. We have many resources. But we need to take the time to not only know the faith, to love it, make it our own. What about that sense of division? How important is it for us to work on not being divided? Well, first, within the church, we have many factions, and we have to be at peace with one another, respecting one another with our various viewpoints. But we can only reach out to others in love and see if they respond or not. Some denominations do, others don't. We have a lot of work to do. Father Jeff, just one final thought. We're a lot better off with an ecumenical spirit rather than one that is prejudicial against all others. For Wineskins, I'm Father Jim Corda. And I'm Father Jeffrey Mickler of the Society of St. Paul. For more information and to listen to Wineskins, visit www.doy.org, the website of the Catholic Diocese of Youngstown. Stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. This year, in an effort to raise awareness for utility assistance during the cold winter months, Catholic Charities has renamed Keep the Kids Warm to Warm Hearts for Warm Homes. Changing the name and focus allows Catholic Charities to expand their reach beyond families with children, to include working adults and older adults that are poor and on fixed incomes, many of whom struggle to keep up with the rising costs of living. For more information or to make a donation, please visit www. Dot ccdoy.org or call Nicole at 330-744-8451 extension 323. Thank you for helping to keep people warm through the Warm Hearts for Warm Homes program. The Johnsons enjoy Friday dinners out. Nothing fancy, just time together to reconnect as family. They make sure others eat as well. By giving to Catholic Charities of Youngstown, the Johnsons join other angels who care for those in need, regardless of religion or race. Show your wings with a gift to Catholic Charities, changing lives one family at a time, providing housing, emergency financial assistance, senior services, and more. Give now at ccdoy.org. Our song today is from the CD called Choral Music for Ordinary Time. It is from WLPmusic.com. Oh 
God has made a vow to us. A promise to us here. He forever walks with us and makes us strong. As we celebrate this second Sunday in Ordinary Time, we will hear more about the Sacred Scriptures by Deacon Bob Reddig. He is from St. Luke Church in Boardman. Artistic depictions of John the Baptist often portray him with one arm outstretched, pointing to Jesus. Such depictions appropriately describe John's mission, which was to prepare others for the coming of the Lord and to point him out to others. Earlier in this same chapter of John's Gospel, we hear, A man named John was sent from God. He came for testimony, to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to testify to the light. Now, nearing the end of his mission, John closes today's Gospel by saying, Now I have seen and testified that he is the Son of God. But what have we seen? What have we experienced? What are we testifying to? At each Mass, we begin with the words, In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. With those words, we are giving testimony to our belief in the Trinity as well as our acknowledgement of God's presence and activity in our lives. So, do our lives and our experience point others to Jesus? They should. Jesus gave his disciples the great commission to take the message of the gospel to the world. At the end of each Mass, we often hear the words, Go and announce the gospel of the Lord. How are we doing with that? What is our mission in life? Do we even perceive ourselves as missionaries? How are we professing our lives in Christ to others? John tells us in today's Gospel that when he baptized Jesus, he saw the Spirit come down like a dove from heaven and remain upon him. In the same manner, When we were baptized, the Holy Spirit descended upon us and remains with us. That's not only fundamental theology for us, it's a holy reality. As you've witnessed the baptism of an infant, have you been able to see the Spirit through eyes of faith? 
if you were baptized as an adult, were you able to sense the presence of the Holy Spirit? Once again, what have you seen? What have you experienced? What are you testifying to? The answers to all of those questions are dependent upon a number of things. First, it's dependent on God's grace, and that reality is always a given. After that, I would offer that the way you might answer those questions are directly related to your prayers and your participation in the sacramental life of the church. So, let us ask Jesus in prayer this day to bless us with a renewed sense of mission. And as we receive him in the Eucharist, may we, like John, realize that we too are sent by God. And may we become ever more aware of how the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit want to reveal themselves to us and guide our lives. For Wineskins, I'm Deacon Bob Redding. We see God as power. Perhaps we need to take another look, this time through the eyes of John the Baptist. That old rugged prophet saw a lamb and a dove when he looked at Jesus. He must have been telling us something about the gentleness of God. Wineskins is a production of CTNY, the Catholic Telecommunications Network of Youngstown. It is brought to you by the Annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts. I'm your host, Father Jim Corda, wishing you a beautiful week. And remember to pray for the unity of all Christians as we commemorate that challenge this week. This year, in an effort to raise awareness for utility assistance during the cold winter months, Catholic Charities has renamed Keep the Kids Warm to Warm Hearts for Warm Homes. Changing the name and focus allows Catholic Charities to expand their reach beyond families with children, to include working adults and older adults that are poor and on fixed incomes, many of whom struggle to keep up with the rising costs of living. For more information or to make a donation, please visit www.ccdoy.org or call Nicole at 330-744-8451, extension 323. Thank you for helping to keep people warm through the Warm Hearts for Warm Homes program.